Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. Uh, beginning at uh, verse 12. Exodus chapter 33, beginning at verse 12. If you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. And you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. Y'all still with me? Show me a way that, that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Y'all still with me? And he said, don't miss this, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I want to talk to us briefly this morning on the subject, when God is in the family. When God is in the family. Y'all say that with me. When God is is in the family. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. Just about all of us have at some point in our existence brought up the issue of the family. You would have to be living under a rock to know, to not know, that our families are in trouble. I say our families are in trouble. When we look at the history uh, of this nation, Particular, we find that there has been a change and a shift in the way family uh, has evolved. It used to be a time where just about all of us valued family to the degree that all of us were together no matter how different you were. It used to be a time where we would embrace the idea of family because we realized that when God set something up, God set it up so that it could be healthy and sustained in their success. And there have been so many different things that have happened in families across the world today that have made family life a little bit harder than perhaps it's ever been in the history of our country. Perhaps even in the history of the entire world. There is information now that we have access to that people hundreds of years ago did not have access to. And now we are at war with so many different ideas and philosophies about the success of family. But when in all of that, God's word has not changed. And, and so uh, the world has a message for how families should be successful today. There are several that teach a philosophy that, that families should just do whatever it wants to do. There's a philosophy that exists that, that when it comes to rearing children, uh, it's okay to just, just be their friends. Lord have mercy. There's a philosophy that communicates a sense of openness that, that the family should function however the family wants to function. We certainly all have the liberty to decide how we are going to uh, function in family, but there's something about God's standard that just can't be beat. And I want to, 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 to talk with us this morning uh, in regards to the family, especially on this day that we're emphasizing family, because I believe that there are some things that God has that every single family needs. Amen, somebody? Amen. And, and I hope you're interested, and even if you're not interested, just hang with us. You might hear something that might bless you. Amen, somebody? Amen. Now, to understand the context of Exodus chapter 33, you need to understand what is going on right before that. You, you remember, everybody remembers Abraham, right? Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob, now that's good Sunday school stuff, y'all. <laughs> Isaac uh, begat 12 sons, and, and those 12 sons were later called the 12 tribes of Israel. Y'all follow me? Of those, tri of those tribes, there was one son, Joseph. Y'all remember what they did with Joseph? They sold him to Egypt. Uh, he became uh, second in command of all Egypt. You know, only God can do that kind of stuff. Amen. He becomes second in command. And when there's a famine in the land, the Bible says that the rest of his family were brought to Egypt and they lived there for the remainder of their lives. 
But then the Bible tells us that there was a Pharaoh who came up centuries later who did not know about Joseph and the unique relationship with the Israelites. And when he looked amongst society, he saw more Israelites than Egyptians. And this created an issue. Y'all remember this? So all of a sudden, the Israelites became slaves to the Egyptians. And it would be at that point that, that God would use a man named Moses. Moses who grew up as a prince of Egypt, who had learned of his Hebrew heritage, who had ran to the desert of Egypt after, or Midian rather, after killing an Egyptian, was ready for retirement. He's 80 years old, and, and he feels like his life is at the end, and God calls him out of a very interesting place in his life. Has anybody ever experienced when you thought your days were numbered, you thought your days were over, and you were done doing all the hard work that God called you to something, and you scratched your head too? He's 80 years old. I know some senior citizens are going to help me this morning. He's 80 years old, and God places a ministry in his life that's much different than what he ever experienced before. God sends him back into Egypt with one single message. Let my people go. It was at this time that the Israelites had not heard from God for over 400 years. And God began to speak through Moses, and it was through Moses that God would liberate the Israelite people, and he would take them to the Red Sea. Y'all remember the Charlton Heston movie that comes on every year? Our favorite part of the movie, right? When the, when the sea begins to open, and they walk through, the Bible says, on oh, dry ground. Isn't that a blessing? But these people were interesting because they had gotten through the Red Sea. They looked back and rejoiced over what God does. But just like so many of us, we have a high moment in life. And then we begin to have amnesia about what God has done in our lives before. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. I just know it's true. Sometimes we experience highs and then we will forget because an issue comes into our lives of the many thousands of times that God has brought us through all of our issues. And so it is in this place of Exodus chapter 33 that Moses is a little frustrated. Have y'all ever been frustrated with people in faith? Moses is frustrated because at this point he needs to know if God is on his side. And I want you to know that every family needs to know if God is on your side. And so there's some principles in this, in this conversation between Moses and God that I believe can be very beneficial in every single family that's here today. And I want you to know, if you're not being perfect, don't worry because none of us have been. If you're not in a perfect family, if you're not in a perfect father, a perfect mother, a perfect child, don't worry, all of us have had our day. Amen, somebody. So since that's the case, then there are some principles here that can help us perhaps start over and be better than where we've been before. Moses had gone up to the Mount Sinai and he was given two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. He comes down the mountain and he sees that the Israelites have begun to worship idol gods. Y'all remember this? And so he threw down the tablets in frustration. He broke them and they did a cleansing of the community. And now in this place, in chapter 33, verse 12, Moses is communicating to the Lord. Watch this in verse 12. The first thing I want you to know is that every family needs the presence of God. Y'all hear what I'm saying this morning? Every family needs the presence of God. Watch this, verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. And therefore I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me now your way. Anybody ever been there in your house before? Where there's some stuff that happened in your house, and you, you've had to kind of hit reset and reevaluate who you were? Because you feel like you had got kind of lost in life, and you know that if you were going to have success, you needed to allow God to be present in your life. Anybody ever been there before? Watch this. He says, he says, show me the way, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. Now watch God in verse 14. God says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Has anybody in here ever had to make a decision in your house and you made, the, you made a decision and you quickly found it was not the will of God? 
That you made the kind of decision that you realized instead of taking you closer to God, it was taking you further to God. And because you made a decision, it was not only taking you further, but taking the folk in your house further too. See, there's a difference between navigating through life and having God navigate your life. I can recall when I first moved here to Montgomery, and uh, I was visiting a sister uh, in, in the hospital at Jackson Hospital, uh, and that was the very same day Sister Pennings in the house uh, that her sister's funeral had, had come, and, and I wanted to just get to Jackson Hospital and then go to the funeral, and I'll never forget the sister that I was visiting, she said, Brother Anderson, you're going to be late. And I said, well, no, I can't be late. I just, that would be a terrible thing, would it not? To the preacher just got in town, be late to folks' funeral, that would be terrible, wouldn't it? Y'all can go ahead and say something. That's okay. I'm not saying what you're thinking. And so I said, well, no, I, 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 I have GPS. I got it all figured out. She said, okay, well, God bless you. I don't want you to be late. I get in my car. I punch in the name of the church. And then I start riding. And all of a sudden, some of y'all can relate to this. GPS just disappeared. Can you understand how I feel? I am late. I'm going to be late for the funeral. Can you imagine the sick feeling that I would be feeling at that time? The thing that was supposed to be navigating my direction is no longer working. Since I've not been in Montgomery very long, I don't even know how to get there. The last thing I remember was that the GPS said I was five minutes away. Can you imagine the feeling of knowing that you're close but you're not there? Y'all gonna help me this morning? And so I began to drive around. I said, well, sir, they're gonna take some folk know where this place is. And so I just stopped on the curb and asked for hey, do you know where such and such is? No, we don't know where that is. I'm driving around. Funeral was in 20 minutes. I've been driving for 15 minutes, and get this, I can't call nobody because the same thing that controls the GPS is the same thing that controls my cellular phone. Y'all gonna help me here. I'm lost, but I'm so close. At the same time, I begin driving and driving and hoping that I would just find it. Y'all know Montgomery streets are a little. I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no harm. I don't know if you ever shot it in your car. I don't know if you've ever thanked God in your car. But you can do more praise and shout in your car than you think you can. But GPS came on and I made it in the nick of time. Preacher, what are you saying? There's some time in your family where you're navigating and you can be close to God. But when you don't surrender your family to God, you can be so close but be so far away at the same time. You may look like you're near. You may but there is nothing like being in God. And Moses is at a point in his life where he said, God, I, I've been walking with you for a while, but, but I just need to get closer. And I believe families are going to get closer to God. Because it's with God that you know where you're going. Amen? Watch this. So every, every family needs his presence. But listen, every family needs his favor. Watch this, look at verse 15, quickly. Verse 15, he says, then he said to him, this is God now, but this is Moses, in your presence, Lord have mercy, does not go with us. Do not bring us up from here. You gotta understand what Moses is saying. He said, God, if you're not there, I don't want to go there. There's some places that if God is not there, as far as the decisions you make in your house, you are not even want to go. There are some decisions that some of us consciously make. We know it's not in line with God's will, and we go there hoping something's going to work out. But listen, how many of y'all can attest to here that it never works out? Amen, somebody? He said, don't, don't, don't let us go from here. Verse 16, for, for how then will it be known that your people, uh, that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we should be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Watch God, verse 17. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. For you have found, get this, grace 
in my sight and I know you by name. Listen, you need to realize that it's so important to have God in your family and God in your house that when you have a relationship with God, y'all, you get stuff just because. Y'all hear what I'm saying this morning? That when you decide to walk with God and take your family with God and allow God into your house, there's some benefits that you get just because God is next to you. Lord, how can I help you with this? Uh, I, I, I recall one time I was going to a sporting event and anybody who has some nosebleed tickets? I mean, you sit so high up, your, your, your ticket actually says nosebleed. <laughs> and I can recall I had these nosebleed tickets. I mean, barely getting in, y'all. And I can recall when I, when I got to the stadium, uh, I had a good friend of mine that, that called me and said, Tim, where you at? I said, oh, man, you, I'm surprised my phone worked up here, brother. <laughs> he said, where you at? I said, man, I'm way up top, such and such and such way. I mean, I'm, I'm about to fall out of the stadium, man. I'm way, don't worry about me, man. Just enjoy the game, bro. And he said, listen, man, listen, listen, listen. He said, I got a seat. Now, just like some of us, where you'll see that. <laughs> I said, where are you sitting? He said, man, I'm down on 50. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking you could be in the 50 and be a nosebleed. You know what I'm saying? I said, he said, no, man, I'm, I'm down on the 50, man. Like, I can see the guys. I can see everything, man. I can see them sweating, brother. I said, man. Now, I'm thinking he called just to tease me. He said, man, I got an extra seat. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So I walk down, proud, walking down to the entrance. And you know when you get real though, there's some, there's some special people who don't just let you walk where you, y'all yeah, know, because y'all have done it, you've done it, I know, you've done it. And so I get down there and the man says, uh, well you know this section is reserved. And then right when he said it, I saw my guy, my guy pointed at me. And I pointed at him like this. And, and I, told, I told the guy, I said, listen, that, that's my guy right there. And the guy looked down and he said, that's my guy. And all of a sudden, the man let me in. Why? Because of who I was connected to. Now, see, listen, I know I wasn't really dressed to sit, but see, they dressed a little different down there, too. I didn't know this. The whole lifetime, I didn't know. See, everybody looked a little different. And there were folks that were sitting down there that looked like they deserved everything they had. But I know that. I 
will proclaim the name of the Lord. Watch this. Of the Lord before you, I will be gracious to whom you will be. I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Y'all hear God talking here? Verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and leave. Verse 21. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. Lord have mercy. Every family needs his providence. Moses is at this place. And it's at this place where he's asking God, as much as I can see, I want to see. And God said, well, you know what? I, I, I can't show you all of me. Because everything that I got is too much for you. And let me add it here and insert this parenthetically and tell you that you ought to only ask God for the stuff God wants to give you. Lord have mercy. Y'all know there's some blessings you can't handle yet. Your prayer ought to be, God, I want it, but if it ain't for me, don't give it to me. Amen, somebody? And so God says, I'm, I'm going to place you in the cleft of the rock. Because when I come past, you're going to get what you need to get. But you got to get in the place in order to get it. Y'all got to follow me here. Your family, God, especially those of us that are parents and adults here, God is determined, is, God is uh, wanting you to lead your family. And you gotta understand that yes, God can be with you, and yes, God can give his favor to you, but there's some providential things that God has to give that if you ain't in the right place, you can't have access to. Lord have mercy. Let me help y'all as I close this point. I remember when I was a child and, and I, I was playing baseball, and uh, I was a little slow on the baseball field. I know y'all didn't know that, but I was. And I mean physically, y'all. See, some of y'all took that to another place. I mean physically. Uh, and, and I can recall, I can recall that the thing I want to do, I want to play outfield. And you know you can't play outfield if you can't throw. First base is where I should have been. But I was in the outfield. Some of y'all just got that. And I, I'll never forget that when the ball would be hit, the very first reaction I would have is to run forward. And I would, I would look at the ball, and I was like, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. And then all of a sudden, oh my goodness. <laughs> Here I am picking it off the ground. Lord have mercy. Throwing it. Lord have mercy. I didn't throw it like that. <laughs> Y'all play too much. Listen. And every time the ball would be hit, my natural reaction would be to run toward the ball. And after about three games, it dawned on me that perhaps the first thing I should do is back up. Because if I don't back up, I can't gauge where the ball is going to be coming. Some of y'all see where this is going. And so what I had to start doing was to deny my own nature, deny my own impulse, and do what was different for me to do. Because the objective is to be in the place to catch the ball. God, I'm going to help the And so what I realized is that when the ball was hit, I had to start back.
this morning, I don't know where you are in your lives. I don't know what has you, what you have experienced, but I know what God can do. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. In other words, God will give you everything you need to do everything he wants you to do. And all you have to do is be faithful to the gospel call. What is the gospel? The gospel is the fact that Jesus was given by God to the world, John 3, 16. Jesus lived a life worth following. He uh, was born of a virgin. He lived in a sinful body but did no sin. He died on the cross on a Friday evening. He, in, in his death, paid for your sin debt. For three days, he was buried in the grave. And on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And now he stands on the right hand of the Father. And now, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, we find that we are to now baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co-equal, because now God has called us into a relationship with him. And the Bible is very clear on how you can become a Christian. The Bible says, first, you've got to hear his word. Romans chapter 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and that hearing comes by the word of God. In other words, as you continue to hear the gospel, it builds a faith in you. The Bible says about faith, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God. But he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Amen, somebody? But once you hear his word and believe it to be true, the Bible says there has to be a change of your mind. You have to realize that coming into a new relationship requires you to bring in a new mindset. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says that we ought not to conform our minds of the world, but transform it by the renewing of it. Amen, somebody? That we've got to say yes to God and no to our own way. But the Bible says that we must be willing to confess that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins and that he now lives with the Father. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. But my friends, baptism is in the plan. Many people say, well, should I, should I, or should I not? Well, let's just listen to Jesus. It's still in the red. Mark chapter 16 and 16. It says, he that believes and conjunction is baptized shall be saved. How am I saved? Believe and baptism. Well, what, what does my baptism do? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why, Peter? For the remission or removal of sins. When you're baptized, God removes your sin. It is not the water that does a magical thing, but it is the obedience to what God says that allows us to be saved. And we thank God for salvation. But if you're here this morning and you are a Christian and you've fallen by the wayside or perhaps you need prayers for strength and encouragement, my friends, I want you to know that today is a beautiful day to start over. Starting over is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. And everybody and anybody can change. Amen, somebody? I don't know what's on your heart, but I know what God can do. And we're asking you that you come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.